While I was working hard on yesterday's video about the imminent arrival of AGI, a brilliant idea occurred to me. A lot of people that are just now realizing that this thing is in fact real and happening would probably like to know what's coming next. Now, some people are screaming apocalypse, some people are worried about the loss of jobs, and some people are just giddy with excitement. Sanguine, in fact. In this video, let's briefly look at why people are concerned. The latest concerning statement out of OpenAI, this whole time they've been pretty clear about what's gonna happen. To their credit, they did not mince their words. They did not sugarcoat it. They didn't cover their message in corporate speak. They straight up said what is going to happen. The problem was they said it so early that most of us missed it. Those of us who saw it probably thought, yeah, maybe this will happen in 50 years. But here's the thing. OpenAI has been ahead of schedule, ahead of everyone on every single point. When they opened their doors and stated that their goal is to build AGI, they were mocked. They were laughed at. No one's laughing now. When a while back, they described what a post AGI world will look like and what we need to prepare. We didn't listen because we figured, hey, we have plenty of time. When they posted a guide on how to safely manage agentic AI, these autonomous AI agents, some companies did not listen. And now they're paying the price. Today, we'll cover all of that. And finally, we'll take a look at what OpenAI said the post AGI world will look like. We also pretty explicitly tell you the two or three things that will actually matter in the post AGI economy. As we look at all this, remember, there's only one rule. Don't panic. Let's dive in. So this is Eduardo and Eduardo posted an AI video generated by Sora on Twitter. Eduardo thought it was pretty cool. The other people did not. Why do you guys think this is a good thing? I'm sure this won't be used for anything awful. The end is near. More things to fuel my nightmares. This is horrifying. We're completely effed. This stuff should not be accessible to the public. AI should be illegal. OpenAI is a bigger threat to national security than TikTok. Now, I'm in favor of everybody having a right to have their opinion, but nothing is worse than TikTok. But a lot of these people went beyond posting comments disagreeing with Eduardo. Here he's showing a picture of his inbox saying, these zombies think I created the AI model Sora and decided to attack me. There's a lot of death threats and all sorts of pretty violent uh, and a lot of pretty scary stuff directed at him. And there's many, many more. His videos are getting tons of views, 16 million. Here's one with the video, almost 26 million. So people are interested, but some percentage of those are very, very angry. Here's a streamer with 2.6 million followers saying, I'm struggling to think of a single positive thing making realistic AI generated videos like this will bring. It's so just net negative and dystopian. He's got 8 million views on that tweet, 155,000 likes, and people are saying better profit margins for people that don't want to hire artists. People will lose their jobs. The doomsday clock might as well be five seconds to midnight. I just see that somewhere there's a random dude with a litter of puppies he wanted to show off, but the AI did a better job. This man has a degree in film and photography. It is now useless in the eyes of companies that need stock photos, and that was his bread and butter. AI generated realism needs to be outlawed everywhere and no one will convince me otherwise. Now, I think this is almost a rule that any sort of any argument or discussion online eventually invokes Hitler. Eventually, whatever you're arguing against, you just say it's worse than Hitler, which brings me to my next tweet, which is AI is like reverse Hitler because we keep waiting on it to kill everybody, but it won't stop making art, which I got to say is a very nuanced take. AI safety memes, which is an account that points out AI danger, the fact that the anti-AI sentiment has really risen after Sora. He's saying, mark my words, within five years, if we're still alive, there will be 100,000 plus person protests. And they won't be advocating for things like pausing AGI, they'll demand a full stop. And he's asking, you want a Butlerian Jihad? This is how you get Butlerian Jihad. Disruption has barely begun, so the backlash has barely begun. So I had to look that one up because I've actually mentioned this in the previous video. I recently started reading Dune, one of the classic sci-fi books. 
somehow I just never got around to reading it. But more and more people are bringing up ideas out of this book, so I figured I should probably read it. And I believe there's a movie on Netflix that's going away soon, and apparently it's, it's pretty good. But this sort of little summary that Google has here is the Batlerian Jihad brought imperial technology to a specialized and codified halt by forcing human minds to develop the revolt ultimately promoted religion over science and technology, and humanists over machines and artificial minds. And apparently after this jihad, there was these commandments. One of them was, thou shall not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. So again, I don't 100% know how accurate these summaries are. I haven't read the book, but I'm beginning to see these ideas pop up in conversation more and more. People have quoted this exact thing. So here he's kind of bringing this idea up like, hey, we might have this happen. Here's a person saying, I need this to be legal now, talking about the picture of puppies in the snow. Again, Eduardo is the one that's receiving death threats and, and just receiving kind of a lot of hates for, for posting these images. Another post with almost 2 million views, Gen AI is a bleep insult to humanity, image and video on their longer historical documents. With AI, images will become nothing more than our entire visual history shoved into a meat grinder and served to us meaninglessly for profit. A craft I've dedicated my entire life to is being replaced by an image prediction slot machine. There are also researchers, for example, Max Tiegmark at MIT. He wrote the book Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Actually, it was one of the names on a paper by MIT in December 2023, so not that long ago called Divide and Conquer Dynamics in AI-Driven Disempowerment. He's saying AI companies are attempting to create AI systems that outperform humans at most economically valuable work. Current AI models are already automating away the livelihoods of some artists, actors, and writers, but there's some infighting between these groups. And in the paper, he has this quote, so this idea that if they come from for one group of people and we don't speak out and one by one everyone else is taken, then when they come for you, there was no one left to speak for you, basically. In the introduction, he mentions OpenAI, the creator of ChatGPT, has stated that its mission is to create highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at most economically viable work. An economist has a prediction about OpenAI's mission, saying a very large number of people will only have marginal jobs or not very meaningful jobs. Others go further, saying in due course, AI might cause lasting structural unemployment on a mass scale. Here he compares the big tech, sort of the people behind AI, to Napoleon invading Prussia, Poland, Russia. The sort of analogous people here are the victims of AI disempowerment. He describes sort of the people, the big tech, as the anti-human movement versus the, you know, the human, the pro-human movement. And he's saying that the pro-human movement can be united by convincing its stakeholders that AI is a large threat. He also mentioned some of the AI leaders' words that, if taken at face value, could inflict the weakness predicted by his model. This idea of like defeatism, basically weakening the pro-human movement, as he calls it. And so here he mentions Mark Zuckerberg, Jan LeCun, Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, Rich Sutton, first ever advisor of Google DeepMind. He also even lists Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, saying AI will probably most likely lead to the end of the world, but in the meantime, there will be great companies. Now, I was surprised to see that quote there. That's, uh, that seemed kind of out of place, uncharacteristic for Sam Altman. Now, I tried finding the source of that quote. I mean, I kind of wanted to know what the context of it is, and uh, I can't find it. It's just a circle of links. So here's fortune.com quoting Altman. That links to futureoflife.org, quoting Altman, but they're saying that was from Business Insider, but that Business Insider article redirects just to their homepage. So I'm not sure exactly where this was taken from. It seems that, you know, there's like a number of publications that all have said it and to sort of source where their information, like one points to this one and this one points to this one and this one points to this one and then this points to this one. So it's like, well, where was it originally said? I mean, maybe I'm just missing it. So if somebody knows where that quote originated, please post it in the comments. I mean, I'd love to see it. I want to know what the context is. I also note this was, they're saying it was in 2015. So this was probably before 
any of the GPTs before any of the progress that we've seen. This was before Google came out with the transformer. So I don't know, is this, is this a good quote to use? He also mentions CEO of Hugging Face, CEO of Anthropic, Andrew Ng, Jan LeCun, and also for some reason, as part of the AI industry leaders, Martin Shkreli. This is Martin Shkreli, you might remember him. I guess he was called the Pharma Bro. But Martin Shkreli says, F AI safety. Me and my robot homies are gonna come to your house. I honestly, I don't even know what to do with this. I'm just kind of, in general, sort of confused about a lot of things in this paper. Why pick this quote? Why pick this quote? You know, from, again, 2015 before, I mean, so, so long ago. Why not pick a quote that's more relevant to what Sam Altman thinks, you know, today? This was published, this paper was published in December 2023. Why pick a quote from 2015? Why pick, you know, I assume this was a tweet kind of being a little bit funny. Me and my robot homies are coming to your house. I, I, I'm not sure if that's serious. So this is the reference for Sam Altman's quote, the man who unleashed AI on an unsuspecting Silicon Valley, Washington Post. So this is that article. And it's this huge article, but again, I, I can't find that quote in there. So if I search for end of the world, nothing, great companies, nothing, none of those words are in there, much less the, the full quote. So I don't know, was that just made up? Uh, I'm not sure. Meanwhile, recently we did have a autonomous driving vehicle in San Francisco, this Waymo car that was destroyed, that was set on fire. A crowd of people surrounded it. I don't think there was anybody in it. I think it was just driving by itself and just basically broke it and set it on fire. So there's, there seems to be a growing fear of these AIs, these autonomous things that's resulting in property damage. And certainly, I mean, I hope it stops there. I really hope it doesn't keep escalating against the people that are perceived to be behind these technologies. Here's one of the OpenAI employees working on Sora that's responding to a post that was deleted by the author. He's saying, we very intentionally are not sharing it widely yet. The hope is that a mini public demo kicks a social response into gear. This was the statement that I think raised some concerns for people because people are asking, what response are you expecting? What are you looking for? Now, I don't know what he meant there, but my take is that that backlash is part of the response that they're looking for. They know how some of the stuff is going to play out. They want people to be amazed. They want people to be afraid. They want the society at large to start kind of processing these ideas. Like we talked about in the previous video, they're incrementally releasing pieces that will eventually become AGI. And a lot of it is uh, playing out according to plan. So the point being is, as we're getting closer to AGI, people are getting anxious. People are getting worked up. People are scared of what this new world may bring. And so people are fighting back against this because they're worried that it's going to take everyone's job, right? They took their jobs. They're concerned that they took their jobs. And that's certainly a scary concept for almost everybody. But is that really the end all and be all thing that we're striving for? In other words, if you had the money to buy whatever you want and you could work on anything you desire, would you still want a job? This is Sam Altman's blog, samalman.com. This is his blog post, Moore's Law for Everything. This post is incredible for two reasons. One is that when you slide the mouse over these dollar bills, they turn to computer chips. It is absolutely incredible. It's, it's very well done. Hang on, I'm almost done. But yeah, anyways. But, and the second reason why this post is so good is because even though it was made on March 16th, 2021, it speaks to a lot of things that were talking about today. Let's take a look. I'm going to open this as a PDF so I can doodle on it. So this is Moore's law for everything. So Moore's law states that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles about every two years with minimal cost increase. And more generally is that technological process basically makes everything better and cheaper at these sort of regular intervals. Now, specifically Moore's law is applied to microchips, computers, sort of how, how fast they are, how cheap they are, etc. But here, Sam Altman saying Moore's Law for everything. And as you'll see in a second, while this is his blog, a lot of people have contributed to this particular article. Now, keep in mind, 2021, probably nobody or very few people knew what he was talking about. Now it's a little bit different. So he starts, my work at OpenAI reminds me every day about the magnitude of the socioeconomic change that is coming sooner than most people believe. Software that can think and learn 
will do more and more of the work that people do now. Even more power will shift from labor to capital. If public policy doesn't adapt accordingly, most people will end up worse off than they are today. We need to design a system that embraces this technological future and taxes the assets that will make up most of the value in the world, companies and land, in order to fairly distribute some of the coming wealth. Now, it's important to note here that most of you listening will probably have some, will have some political leading. We all do. For the time being, I ask that you try to think of this outside of existing political structures. Whatever party you belong to, whatever your beliefs are, let's just see if we can follow his thought process and his arguments and see if they make sense. And by the way, I'm not saying he is right. I'm not saying he's wrong. None of this is me telling you what to think. I have no idea how to do any of this. But Sam Altman seems to have a longer time horizon into how things are shaping up. He seems to be ahead of the curve. He's in the middle of everything, talking to the experts, the people pushing this forward. He's got a front row seat into the development of AI. And so from his vantage point, this is what he's seeing. It's important to know what he thinks, where he's going to try to steer the ship. Whether you agree with it or not, first and foremost, just understand what he's saying. He's saying that in the next five years, so this is now, basically, computer programs that can think will read legal documents and give medical advice. In the next decade, they will do assembly line work and maybe even become companions. And in the decades after that, they will do almost everything, including making new scientific discoveries that will expand our concept of everything. If you've been following what DeepMind is doing with AlphaFold and the various drug discovery algorithms, their known project it has discovered autonomously, fully autonomously, AI plus robot. It discovered millions of new materials with deep learning. This was end of 2023. Here's a chart that I think kind of illustrates the scope of this. This dark blue circle in the, in the center here, or in the middle rather, that's how much we, the humans, have figured out how many materials we've discovered with human experimentation. 20,000, that's us. With computational methods, we more than doubled that to 48,000. This is that second circle. And then comes GNOME or GNOME, who knows? It doesn't matter. The point is it discovered 421,000, or rather I think it brought the total amount to 421,000. So this big, 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 big circle, that's how much AI plus robotics moved our knowledge of the world forward. This little blue circle, that's how much we moved our knowledge forward. So this isn't the future, this is like last year. The AI comes up with candidates for various materials that could potentially exist with certain traits and structures that may be interesting for semiconductors or building materials or whatever. And then a robot sits there in this bulletproof cage, or rather like an explosion-proof casing, and tries to create them. There it is. It's got beakers and a heating plate. It's got everything that it could possibly need to try to create some of these compounds in case it finds a compound that blows up, it's behind this, I assume, some sort of explosion-proof glass shielding. The AI comes up with recipes, or potential recipes, and this thing sits there and cooks 24 hours a day. So again, Sam Altman's talking about this, you know, several years before that research was published. And he's saying this technological revolution is unstoppable. It's the juggernaut, bro. And truly it is, because all the research, all the software that kind of led up, all the breakthroughs, they're, they're already out there. People know what those things are. The point is beforehand, you needed to have a semi-wealthy nation state to develop stuff like this. Now you don't. You can have it in a basement. So in other words, let's say all the nations get together and the United States pinky swears that it will stop developing AI. And China pinky swears that it will stop developing AI. And Russia pinky swears that it will stop developing AI. And the UAE, all the factions in the Middle East, they swear, and India, and everybody else swears on whatever religious or secular symbol that they feel is appropriate, that they will stop developing AI. Whoever actually stops, they'll kind of permanently lose the game. And I'll bet you this second edition book, The Prince, by Niccolo Machiavelli, that they will not stop. Back to Sam Altman and a recursive loop of innovation. So this is that compounding effect. That's that second part of the chessboard, like what we talked about. This idea that the rate of improvement of progress is getting faster. The chart kind of looks like this. 
as these smart machines themselves help us make smarter machines. And we've seen this in a lot of stuff that's coming out with synthetic data, with reinforcement learning, with AI feedback, as opposed to reinforcement learning with human feedback. So we started with human people, humans, I should say, saying, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down to train these machines to kind of align them with what we want. Now, more and more, we're seeing examples in these research papers where the AI itself aligns and trains that AI. It creates the data to train it. It does reinforcement learning of AI feedback. Basically, humans, we built version 1.0 of AI. Version 1.0 of AI is helping us build version 2.0 of AI, and that will help us build, you know, version infinity. And so Sam is saying this will accelerate the revolution's pace. And he's saying there's three crucial consequences that will follow. See if you agree with this. One, this revolution will create phenomenal wealth. The price of many kinds of labor, which drives the costs of goods and services, will fall towards zero once sufficiently powerful AI joins the workforce. So he's not just talking about more income. He's also talking about lower prices. Number two is the world will change so rapidly and so drastically that an equally drastic change in policy will be needed to distribute this wealth and enable more people to pursue the life that they want. If we get both these right, we can improve the standard of living for more people than we've ever had before. Because we are at the beginning of this tectonic shift, we have a rare opportunity to pivot towards the future. What follows is a description of what's coming and a plan of how to navigate this new landscape. Part 1. The AI Revolution On a zoomed-out timescale, technological progress follows an exponential curve. This is the world GDP per capita from the year 1000 to, I mean, this ends in the year 2000. So this is how much production happens in the world per person, per each individual that we have in the world. It skyrockets, becoming near vertical. 15 years ago, we had no smartphones. 150 years ago, we had no combustion engine, no home electricity. 1500 years ago, no industrial machines. And 15,000 years ago, no agriculture. This new coming change, this AI, it's going to center around our most impressive capability. This phenomenal ability to think to create, to understand, and to reason. So on top of all our technological revolutions, the agricultural, the industrial, the computational, we now have a fourth, the AI revolution. This will generate enough wealth for everyone to have what they need if we as a society manage it responsibly. Part two, Moore's Law for everything. There are two paths to affording a good life. Either acquire more money, which makes the person wealthier, or prices fall, which makes everyone wealthier. Wealth is buying power, how much we can get with the resources we have. The best way to increase societal wealth for everyone is to decrease the cost of goods. From food to video games, I love the two categories that he chose to use there. I mean, those are critical, critical. Food and video games, what else do you need? And here he mentions the Moore's Law. Chips became twice as powerful for the same price every two years. And here, AI will lower the cost of goods and services because labor is the driving cost for many levels of the supply chain. If robots can build a house on land you already own from natural resources mined and refined on site using solar power, the cost of building that house is close to the cost to rent the robots. And if those robots are made by other robots, then that cost is even less. AI doctors could reduce medical costs. And he's saying, imagine a world where for decades, everything from housing to education, food, clothing, became half as expensive every two years. And that's an interesting question, right? Let's say a car that you wanted cost 100000 Two years later, that same car is 50000 Two years later, it's 25000 Two years later, it's 13000 And this is happening not just to the price of the car, but to the price of everything. Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the world, I think his average compounding rate every year was... I want to say 20%. I might be off on that. But let's let's assume it's 20%. It doesn't really matter what that number is. The point is, every year his wealth increases 20%. In this scenario, your wealth increases 50% every year. Actually, it would average to like 41 point something percent. This is why I don't do math in public, but it doesn't matter. The point is, in this scenario, your wealth, your ability to buy things would be increasing much faster than than, than Buffett's did over the last, whatever, 300 years that he was alive. The reason I point this out is because I think that people don't really understand the idea of real and nominal value of money. Basically, if you have a dollar and you put it in the stock market and it becomes $2, most people will say, I just doubled my money. I'm twice as rich. But if in the same time they've printed trillions of dollars, 
and now everything's twice as expensive, you, you basically still have a dollar. The nominal changed, but the real value remained the same. And part three, capitalism for everyone. Sam Altman saying a stable economic system requires two components, growth and inclusivity. Economic growth matters because most people want their lives to improve every year. In a zero-sum world with no or very little growth, democracy can become antagonistic as people seek to vote money away from each other. What follows from that antagonism is distrust and polarization. In a high-growth world, these dogfights can be far fewer because it's easier for everyone to win. Economic inclusivity means everyone having a reasonable opportunity to get the resource they need to live the life they want. This matters because it's fair, produces a stable society, no guillotines, and as a side benefit, it produces more growth. Capitalism is a powerful engine of economic growth because it rewards people for investing in assets that generate value over time, which is an effective incentive system for creating and distributing technological gains. The price of that progress in capitalism is inequality. Some inequality is okay. In fact, it's critical, as shown by all systems that have tried to be perfectly equal. But a society that does not offer sufficient equality of opportunity for everyone to advance is not a society that will last. The traditional way to address inequality has been by progressively taxing income for a variety of reasons that has not worked very well. It will work much, much worse in the future. While people still have jobs, many of those jobs won't be ones that create a lot of economic value. As AI produces most of the world's goods and services, people will be freed up to do whatever they want. We should therefore focus on taxing capital rather than labor. And we should use these taxes as an opportunity to directly distribute ownership and wealth to citizens. The best way to improve capitalism is to enable everybody to benefit from it directly as an equity owner. This is not a new idea, certainly, right? We've heard this idea before, but it's new in an important way. It's newly feasible as AI grows more powerful, which I'm reading here as we finally have, potentially, in the future, something that could make this possible, realistic, because there will be dramatically more wealth to go around. The two dominant sources of wealth will be, one, companies, particularly ones that make use of AI, and two, land, which has a fixed supply. Eventually, most other taxes could be eliminated. Here he's talking about something called the American Equity Fund. He's proposing that other nations work to create something similar. In the last few weeks, we've seen Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, going to other nations and sort of group of nations with lots of funds and talking about sovereign AI, the idea that they should create their own AI based on their culture that they control the data for, and maybe potentially creating something like this for that country or that group of countries that are kind of aligned together. And so he's saying this equity fund could be capitalized by taxing companies above a certain valuation and by taxing 2.5% of the value of all privately held land. And then all citizens over 18 would get an annual distribution in dollars and company shares into their accounts. They can use that money however they want to, better education, healthcare, housing, starting a new company, whatever. Each citizen would increasingly partake in the freedoms, powers, autonomies, and opportunities that come with economic self-determination. Poverty would be greatly reduced. A tax payable in company shares will align incentives between companies, investors, and citizens, whereas a tax on profits does not. Profits can be hidden, but everyone who owns a share in Amazon wants the share price to rise. People will have a literal stake in seeing their country and their economy do well. Part four, implementation and troubleshooting. We're going to skip most of this. I will link this in the description. I highly recommend people read this. If this is something that's interesting to you, obviously, but I'm sure you probably have some questions about how all this could be implemented. You probably have some ideas of the problems that it will face. They talk about how land would play a factor so that it's distributed, not held by a few large players how to prevent people from offshoring stuff, how to prevent people from voting themselves more money. And finally, and this is interesting, you can't let people borrow against, sell, or otherwise pledge their future fund distributions. The government can simply make such transactions unenforceable. Then they mention once AI starts to arrive, growth will be extremely rapid. The changes that are coming are unstoppable. If we embrace them and plan for them, we can use them to create a much fairer, happier, and more prosperous society. The future can be almost unimaginably great. And here he thanks some people that helped contribute to this, I don't know what to call it, proposal. I mean, it's a blog post, basically. It's not even a, an official proposal or anything. But as you can tell, a lot of thought has been put into this. I'm noticing Ilya Sutskever's name on here, Daniela Amode. I wonder if she's related to 
oh, I guess their brother and sister duo at the helm of Anthropic. So the other big AI company, OpenAI and Anthropic kind of have a lot of shared history. And so I guess this is a brother sister duo, Amade. I think this might be the CEO of GameStop, Reed Hoffman. This person, I believe, is part of Stripe. But I think the point here is that we kind of have two roads ahead of us, two paths, if you will. And one is, of course, where AI is bad. This is safety issues. This is job loss, disempowerment. This is all of the world's resources concentrating in a small number of people, potentially tyrannical governments using various AI surveillance and robots and whatnot to control the population, to control their populace. And this is where AI is good. This is growth, prosperity, scientific discovery, robots doing dangerous tasks, helping us take care of the disabled, the elderly. I think education will fundamentally change. We've talked about the two sigma problem this channel. I think AI can really, really improve education in a just a massive way. And certainly this is the future that I would love to have for, you know, the world, for everybody. And I got to say, I mean, I certainly understand the fears of a lot of these people. It's hard to just dismiss all the bad stuff that can happen. The safety issues, the job loss, the economy becoming even more unequal. So again, I'm not here to tell you what you think. I'm actually more curious about what you think. What do you think? Keep in mind, Sam Altman is the one that's on the very, 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 very inside of this AI development. He's the one that's been traveling the world, talking to all the world leaders. It seems like he's got an open communication with everybody in power. Like he's at the center of everything with the resources and connections and just, just everything. So let's just for a second assume that he will be able to execute this plan. Now, there's obviously 50 million ways in which it could fail. I get that could be hijacked by bad actors. It could just, a number of things could go wrong. But my question is, let's say he executes everything perfectly and you find yourself in this world where you get money for nothing and your chips for free, where basically everything's cheap to where you don't have to work for the stuff that you need for basic survival. You can still go and pursue whatever you want. And ideally there's less poverty, there's less lack. More people are doing all right potentially less violence, less Waymo cars getting set on fire. So I'm curious, if they were able to do this and execute this, does that look like a good future to you? That's the first question. Just as described at face value, do you like it? Number two, I'm curious if you think it's realistic. And number three, if you're comfortable, I'd love to know this. How have you been sort of, how do you lean politically? Like if you're left-leaning, does this appeal to you? If you're right-leaning, does this appeal to you? I'm curious if this has more of a more of a connection with certain sides of the aisle. Because to me, I mean, this has some very capitalist ideas, but also it has some, some socialist ideas. What it seems to me like is he's trying to think from first principles, meaning if you let go of your, all the preconceived notions of your political affiliations, of, of all of that stuff, and you just think with a fresh perspective. If automation and robots are taking over, if the price of human labor is dropping to zero or approaching zero and all the goods and services become super cheap, homes and medicine and education becomes very, very cheap to where anybody can afford it, do we implement something like this? And if that plan is bad that Sam Altman is proposing, then what? We can't just shut things down. Again, I really don't think this is a real possibility. We would need like a global surveillance state in order to, to make sure no one's cooking something up in their basement and we can't have a continual improvement of like the computer chips. Like it just doesn't seem feasible to just shut everything down at this point. Like that's not, I, I just don't even see how. Or present that another way. Let's say right now the entire world spends, let's say five trillion on salaries, on labor, on, you know, this is what they pay people to do all the stuff that people do. That's the money people take home to buy groceries and houses and cars and whatever, education, or scratch that, uh, food and video games. They buy food and video games, right? So let's say in 10 to 20 years, that number gets only reduced to 1 trillion. Only 1 trillion is spent on human labor because everything gets automated. This $4 trillion number, like where does that money go? Does that just drop down to the company's bottom line? Does it just, it's just, just profit? Or does this money kind of go back to, to the people, the people that lost that income that they sort of are able to pay for stuff along with the decreasing prices on everything. But again, I'm not here to 
convince you of anything or tell you what to think. I'm just saying that all the people that are worried about AI, all the people that are very optimistic about AI, we need to maybe, you know, figure it out and reach some sort of a consensus. Like we should probably talk about what we want. It's kind of an important decision that's being made. And I'm not 100% sure who's making it. As I was wrapping up this video, I just saw this. OpenAI launched this. It must have been very recently. This is the first time I'm hearing of it. This is forums.openai.com. Now, this is not the developer forums that they used to have for quite a while now. This is something different. This is an initiative that brings together domain experts and students to discuss and collaborate on the present and future of AI. In-person meetups, dinner mixers, technical talks, educational webinars, and roundtable conversations. You can apply to join. Why are they doing this? Well, first of all, their mission, OpenAI's mission is to ensure artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. And why are they opening this up? Is they want various researchers and experts and practitioners the opportunity to contribute to the discourse that is shaping the future of AGI. So this thing, I just found out about it after I finished recording the video. So as I'm saying, you know, who are the people determining how this thing gets rolled out? I mean, it looks like OpenAI is seemingly actively trying to get more people, more buy-in, more people talking about this stuff, getting ready for this stuff, and, and, and being part of that network. So I'll post a link in the description. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but it sounds like this could be potentially a way to get closer to the people that are developing AGI, that are releasing AGI, and potentially even help shape how that emerges into the world. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I think these are extremely important events, extremely important topics. I hope I'm doing a good job of covering some of this stuff. And whatever else you do, just pay attention to this stuff because I feel like things are really heating up. Like it's, it's, it's moving faster now. And this may be the biggest time in history when individuals can shape how the future is built. The leverage for whatever you want to do, potential leverage right now is bigger than anything else that's ever existed. Whether you want to just make a boatload of money or for the good of the people or both. But whatever you want to do, I think that leverage exists for all of us right now, and it's much bigger than perhaps ever in history. So with that said, my name is Wes Rob. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.